I've made billions of dollars of failures at Amazon.com. Literally billions of dollars of failures. It's easy to have ideas. It's very hard to turn an idea into a successful product. Do something you're very passionate about and don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. He's best known as the founder, chairman, and CEO of Amazon.com. He's also the founder of Blue Origin, a human spaceflight company. He's currently listed as the third wealthiest person in the world with a net worth of $72.8 billion. He's Jeff Bezos, and here's my take on his top 10 rules for success, volume two. Also guys, as you're watching, if you hear something that really resonates with you, please leave it down in the comments below and put quotes around it so other people can be inspired. Also, when you write it down, it's much more likely to lock in for yourself as well. Enjoy. My job, one of my jobs as the leader of Amazon is to encourage people to be bold. And people love to focus on things that aren't yet working. Um, and that's good, it's human nature, that kind of divine discontent can be very helpful. But uh, you really, you know, it's incredibly hard to get people to take bold bets, and you need to encourage that. And if you're gonna take bold bets, they're gonna be experiments, and if they're experiments, you don't know ahead of time whether they're gonna work. Uh, experiments uh, are, by their very nature, uh, prone to failure. But big successes, a few big successes, compensate for dozens and dozens of things that didn't work. So, you know, bold bets, AWS, Kindle, Amazon Prime, our third-party seller business, all of those things are examples of bold bets that, uh, that, that did work, and they pay for a lot of experiments. I've made billions of dollars of failures at Amazon.com, literally billions of dollars of failures. And, uh, uh, you know, you might remember Pets.com or Cosmo or, you know, I can give myself a root canal with no anesthesia very easily. Uh, none of those things are fun, but they, but they also, they don't matter. What really matters is companies that don't continue to experiment, companies that don't embrace failure, they eventually get in a desperate position where they, the only thing they can do is make a kind of Hail Mary bet at the very end of their corporate existence. Whereas companies that are, you know, uh, making bets all along, even, you know, big bets, but not bet the company bets. I don't, I don't believe in bet the company bets. That's when you're desperate. That's, that's the last thing you can do. We know from our past experiences that big things start small. Uh, you know, it, uh, the biggest oak starts from an acorn, and you've got to recognize, if you want to do anything new, you've got to be willing to let that acorn grow into a little sapling and then finally into a small tree, and maybe one day it'll be a big business on its own. And in fact, that's one of the um, mottos for one of your initiatives, and forgive my, my pronunciation of the Latin, but Greta Team Ferocity. What does that mean to you? Well, it, it means step-by-step uh, -step ferociously and it's the motto for Blue Origin. Um, and uh, uh, basically, you can't skip steps. You have to put one foot in front of the other. Things take time. Uh, you, there are no shortcuts. And, uh, but, uh, but you wanna do those steps with you know, passion and ferocity. I think probably our most important piece of intellectual property is our brand name. And I think people, and, and, and I think this is very important for anybody who's going to start a company or, or, or market an invention to understand, is that brands for companies are like reputations for people. And reputations are hard-earned and easily lost. So the most important intellectual property that a company can have is, for us, it's, that, it's, it's, it's Amazon. It's the, that name, but what it stands for. And we've worked very hard to earn trust. You can't ask for trust. You just have to do it the hard way, one step at a time. You, you make a promise and then fulfill the promise. You say, we'll deliver this to you, uh, you know, tomorrow, and then you actually deliver it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what and if you do that over and over again, then it ultimately you can instill your company's name with a reputation. And that's, I think, you know, sometimes people talk about brands in this very amorphous way, but for me, 
I, I like to think of it as a person and what is the reputation that that person has and how have they earned that reputation. I think stress, you can be, uh, I think one of the things that's very important to note about stress is that stress primarily comes from not taking action over something that you can have some control over. So if I find that some particular thing is causing me to have stress, that's a, uh, a, a warning flag for me. What it means is there's something that I haven't completely identified, perhaps in my conscious mind, that is bothering me and I haven't yet taken any action on it. I find as soon as I identify it and make the first phone call or send off the first email message or whatever it is that we're gonna do to start to address that situation, even if it's not solved, the mere fact that we're addressing it dramatically reduces any stress that might come from it. So stress comes from ignoring things that you shouldn't be ignoring, um, I think in large part. So uh, stress doesn't come, people get stress uh, uh, wrong all the time, in my opinion. Stress doesn't come from hard work, for example. You know, you can be working incredibly hard and loving it. And likewise, you can be out of work and incredibly stressed over that. So, and likewise, if you kind of use the, you know, use that as an analogy for what I was just talking about, if you're out of work, but you're going through, you know, a disciplined uh, approach of, you know, a series of job interviews and so on and working to remedy that situation, you're going to be a lot less stressed than if you're just worrying about it and doing nothing. If you're giving a great customer experience, um, there's, the only way to do that is with happy people. You can't do it with a set of miserable people, um, you know, watching the clock all day. So does that include work-life balance and all those things? Yes, but I would, I use, I teach um, three uh, leadership classes a year at Amazon. I'm a part of it. They're bigger classes, but I come in and teach a session. And I always talk about work-life balance, except I like to use the phrase work-life harmony rather than balance, because to me, balance implies a strict trade, whereas I find that when I am happy at work, I come home more energized, I'm a better husband, a better dad, and when I'm happy at home, I come in and better boss and better colleague. And so that, that um, it's not, you could be out of work and be, have terrible work-life balance. You know, even though you've got all the time in the world, you, right. you could just feel like, oh my God, you know, I'm miserable and you would be draining energy. And so you have to find that harmony. It's a much better word. And I think for most people, it's about meaning. People want to know that they're doing something interesting and useful. And for us, you know, because of the challenges that we have chosen for ourselves, uh, we get to work in the future. And it's super fun to work in the future for the right kind of person. It's easy to have ideas. It's very hard to turn an idea into a successful product. There are a lot of steps in between, and it takes persistence, relentlessness. So I always tell people who are, you know, who think they want to be entrepreneurs, it's, you need a combination of stubborn relentlessness and flexibility. And you have to know when to be which. And basically, you need to be stubborn on your vision because otherwise it'll be too easy to give up. But you need to be very flexible on the details because as you go along pursuing your vision, you'll find that some of your preconceptions were wrong and you're gonna need to be able to change those things. So I think uh, taking an idea successfully all the way to the market and turning it into a real product that people care about and that really improves people's lives is a lot of hard work. I had some family role models, and I had some other people, um, you know, some sort of historical role models that I really looked at, too. So certainly my, my uh, uh, grandfather was a serious role model for me. I just had spent so much time. I think you learn different things from grandparents than you learn from parents. It's, a, it's a great. I would encourage anybody to try to spend time not only with their parents but with their grandparents. Um, and, uh, but I, and I also had uh, uh, I, two people I always would read about and, uh, and, and were Thomas Edison and Walt Disney. Those were sort of my two you know, biographical heroes. <laughs> <laughs>
I've always been interested in, in inventors and invention. And Edison, of course, just you know, for for uh, a, a little kid is the, and probably for adults too. I still feel this way, at least, is the not only the symbol of that, but the actual fact of that. The just incredible inventor, um, and uh, and I've always felt that there's a certain kind of uh, important pioneering that goes on from an inventor like Thomas Edison. And then Disney was a different sort of thing. It, he also, you know, a real pioneer and an inventor and doing new things. But it seemed to me that he had this incredible capability to uh, create a vision that he could get a large number of people to share. Because the, the things that Disney invented, like Disneyland, you know, the, the theme parks and so on, they were such big visions that no single individual, unlike a lot of the things that Edison worked on, no single individual could ever pull them off. Um, and, uh, and Walt Disney really was able to get a big team of people working in a concerted direction. I don't really remember the exact day or anything, but when I was in college is when I started thinking about wanting to be uh, an entrepreneur someday. So it was, I was not the kid with the lemonade stand. You know, I didn't, I wasn't one of these kids who was always trying to raise money. I always wanted to be a scientist when I was little. Uh, but I'd also always loved computers. I like, I was lucky because at my age this is unusual to have uh, access to a mainframe computer from my elementary school when I was in fourth grade. And uh, quickly learned that the, the, there was a pre-programmed Star Trek game on that computer, and then I never did anything except play Star Trek with the computer. So I don't know how formative that was. It certainly led. It certainly helped my Star Trek knowledge considerably. <laughs> and and but I've always loved computers. Somewhere in college, I started watching some of the people who were like setting up, you know, college pizza delivery services, and you know, the kind of the core entrepreneurs, and thinking, you know, this looks like a really fun thing to do. I think it's the very rare idea that can be done by a single individual. Almost everything that is going to uh, change the world, solve a problem, improve something, these are usually big efforts and they require uh, you know, teams, a team working together to really get something important done. And that has been the story of Amazon.com. At every step along the way, we've had a team here uh, that is uh, is making this work. I mean, it, it, I don't know, even, even at the smallest scale, you have to figure out how to get help from your friends, from your family members, uh, from uh, people that you can hire in those early days. I think without that, it would never work. Do something you're very passionate about. And don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. I think we actually saw this, I think you see it all over the place in many different contexts, but I think we saw it uh, in the internet world quite a bit, where, you know, at the sort of peak of the uh, sort of internet, uh, you know, mania in, say, 1999, you found people who were, uh, you know, very passionate, something they kind of left that job and decided I'm going to, you know, do something in the internet because it's, you know, it was almost like the you know, the 1849 gold rush in a way. I mean, you find that people, uh, if you go back and study the history of the 1849 gold rush, you find that, you know, uh, at that time, everybody who was in, within the shouting distance of California was, you know, they might have been a doctor, but they quit being a doctor and they started panning for gold. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that almost never works. Um, and even if it does work, uh, you know, according to some metric, financial success or whatever it might be, I suspect it leaves you ultimately unsatisfied. So you really need to be very clear with yourself. And I think one of the best ways to do that is this notion of projecting yourself forward to age 80, looking back on your life and trying to make sure you've minimized the number of regrets you have. That works for, that works for career decisions. It works for family decisions. Um, you know, do you want, I, I have a, a 14-month-old son, and it's very easy for me to, if I think about myself when I'm 80, I know I want to watch that little guy grow up. Um, and so it, it's, I don't want to be 80 and think, shoot, you know, I, I missed that whole thing and I don't have the kind of relationship with my son that I wished I had and so on and so on. So if you think about that, so I, I guess another thing that I would recommend to people is that they always take a long-term point of view. And I think this is something about which there's a lot of uh, controversy. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, you know, some, a lot of people, and I'm just not one of them, believe that you should live for the now. 
I think what you do is you think about the, 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 the great expanse of time ahead of you and try to make sure that you're planning for that in a way that's going to leave you ultimately satisfied. Um, so this is just my, this is the way it works for me. And I mean, this is, everybody needs to find that for themselves. Um, uh, so I think there are a lot of paths to satisfaction and you need to find one that works, works for you. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'd love to know what did you think of this video and in general, what do you think of our volume two series? Leave it down in the comments below. I'm super curious to find out what you have to say. Also, I'd love to learn what did you take from this video? What did you learn from Jeff today? Which clip resonated the most with you? And what are you going to immediately apply to your life or your business somehow? Please leave it down in the comments and I'm gonna join in the discussion. Finally, I want to give a quick shout out to Carolyn Owens. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for picking up a copy of my book, Year One Word, and posting a picture of it on Twitter. I really, really, really appreciate the support and I hope you're enjoying the read. So thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is. Much love. I'll see you soon. The best defense to, uh, to speech that you don't like about yourself as a public figure is to develop a thick skin. It, 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 it's really the only effective defense because you can't stop it. Um, you know, you are going to be misunderstood. If you're doing anything interesting in the world, you're going to have critics. The only way, if you, if you absolutely can't tolerate critics, then don't do anything new or interesting. <laughs> and then you can insulate yourself. Then think how wonderful your life will be. Is that the Bezos principle? Um, yeah. Usually people, when you, if you see something, I don't know, you're kind of a public figure and you've probably things have probably been written about you that you didn't think were nice. That's true. And, um, and, and, and my, my advice, if you came to me and said, Jeff, this, you know, somebody wrote this and it really hurt my feelings, what should I do? I would say, go stand on a street corner and watch in a crowded urban area and watch all the people walk by and think about what they're thinking about. I bet you none of those people are thinking about you. If you're standing on that street corner, and really, in your mind, you can do this thought experiment, like, okay, there's a woman who just walked by. What's she actually thinking about? Probably, what might, maybe what she's going to cook for dinner that night, or that um, the argument that she had with one of her employees, or whatever it is. Like, it's not about us. A lot of small book publishers and other smaller companies worry that the power of Amazon gives them no chance. You gotta earn your keep in this world. When you invent something new, if customers come to the party, it's disruptive to the old way. Yeah, but I mean, there are areas where your power's so great and your margin, you're prepared to make it so thin that you can drive people out of business and you have that kind of strength are, and people worried, is Amazon ruthless in their pursuit of market share? The internet is disrupting every media industry, Charlie. You know, people can complain about that, but complaining is not a strategy. Amazon is not happening to book selling. The future is happening to book selling.